We made woven raised beds here over 20 years ago. Now they've gone and we've replaced them, but see us make them. I designed my vegetable patch 10 years ago, and because I like growing lots of different varieties, I've already extended it with these raised sleeper beds. Now I'm going to add another extension. I'm going to make a series of raised beds and I'm going to design them so they're rustic to tie in with the sleepers. And then I'm going to plant that new raised bed with lots of companion planting. And I think all those different smells and flowers will actually confuse the insects and the pests and will help them dive into those and hopefully they'll give my cabbages a bit of a chance instead. It's all looking a little bit of a mess here. You're in a joke now, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can only make it look better. That's one good thing. Well, yeah, there is that. Mm, definitely. What we're doing then, go on. So what we're going to do is we're going to have three long raised beds all the way down, right. quite narrow, to put some herbs in. Right, so first of all, you want to clear it out. I think yeah. we want to clear it all out and we can see what we're dealing with, yep. yes. So what are we going to do with the ends? Well, I don't really want curvy ends because we're going to have a timber coping. You know, this is just going to be simple and straightforward. All right. Maybe sleepers? I mean, that would give us a good firm fixing for your fencing. Along it would the front. make sense. And then we're keeping yeah. just the simple materials, what we've already got, without bringing in another dimension. Yeah. Nice and easy. Sounds pretty easy. Let's get cracking then. Go on. Sunflowers are a great annual flower to grow in your garden. And each year, I like to choose one or two different varieties that I haven't grown before. At the end of the summer, it seems a bit of a shame just to rip them up and throw them away. They're now full of seeds for the birds, which they really love. So what I do is I cut them down, take them indoors and dry them by hanging them upside down. And then when it gets really cold and frosty and there's not many berries around, I bring them out for the birds. You say this was an old track down here? Yes, yeah, an old road runs all the way down with grass over the top. Oh, right. Having removed most of the plants, we soon ran into our first problem. Adam wanted the new beds to run in a straight line, but I wanted them to follow the line of the existing beds. It was time to put my foot down. At the moment, I don't know, it just... At the moment it's a dog leg, but what worries me is when you walk along the line, you'll see the beds getting thinner and fatter. You know, this isn't the M4. I've got a funny feeling we're going to do what you say anyway, so... We don't have to be really dead straight. It's laid back, it's rustic, it's hurdles and sleepers. You know, chill out. Let's, let's fudge it a bit. Let's... Make that line slightly more straight and let's have a bit of give and take in the beds. It was a nice idea to use the sleepers on the ends here. It will work well. Thank you very much. Good compromise on the line as well. Yeah, I think so. I think it'll work very nice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there is a big confusion about sleepers. Basically, it's the creosote. Yeah. That's what they're talking That's the big, big issue with it all. They always uh, knew it was a little bit harmful, but they didn't realise it was as carcinogenic as it has yeah. proven to be. And the EU, always the EU, have said we cannot use them yeah, in right. gardens when um, people come in contact. contact with them. We're starting to push people slow, slowly more towards you know, new sleepers, which are precious treated timbers. And they're not quite that rustic look, but Chris, you know, with a, with a bit of sort of treatment on them, colour treatment, you know, they're looking fine. Yes, um, or you can just use hardwood sleepers, yeah. um, which are reclaimed, which haven't got the time creosote. Which obviously we've done today. Mm. So having got them here in position, how are we going to fix them? Right. So uh, what we're going to do, get them in, level yeah. them up, um, then we'll get a two by two post, put those in behind, down into the ground, screw through, and that'll give you a lovely firm fixing. Start to build your fence. Great. With the area fully cleared and marked out, it was time to start making our raised beds, but not before the arrival of one last material, and one of my favourites. Hazel is really coming back into vogue now. These were cut from trees that are about 200 years old, and what happens is they're cut on about an eight-year cycle, right down to the ground. And then over the eight years, all these massive branches grow up. Some are fat like this, and some are much thinner. The fatter ones are often used for furniture making. The thinner ones are used for weaving, and the middle-sized ones are often used for great hazel hurdles. They'll last about eight years, I reckon, if you're using them above ground, maybe a bit longer with a bit of luck. And the cost, they're great value for money. They cost about 10 pounds for a bundle of 50, and you can do an awful lot with a bundle of 50. Nice, light little bundle, please. Mm -hmm. 
With all the materials in place, it was time to start flexing our muscle. We are banging these posts into the ground. They've got nice pointy ends, so they slip in fairly easily. And they're about two inches diameter. We're going to put them at about 400 millimetres apart. We could close them up and have them at about 300 millimetres apart. It depends how tight a weave of hazel you want to put in between them. You need to really bang them in about a foot into the ground because they are going to actually form the structure of the fence and they're going to hold that earth back. It's a very simple green way that you can form a retaining wall and it looks really nice too. Once the tunnelised posts had been hammered far enough into the ground to make them sturdy, we began weaving the hazel in between each post. With the hazel fence in place, it was now just a case of sawing those rather tall posts down so they were level with the top of the hazel. Looks better than it did this morning, Bunny. Perfect line, look. We've finished weaving the hazel now, and I'm really pleased with the end result. It looks rustic, but it also looks pretty neat too. The next stage was to put the black polythene in behind the hazel. This is held in place by the soil and then it will be wedged underneath the timber coping that sits on the top. The reason for this black polythene is it just stops all the soil trickling out through the hazel every time you water the beds. This timber coping is softwood. It's been pressure treated with preservatives, so it should last for a good 10 or 12 years. It'll stop the water penetrating into the tops of these posts and rotting them. It'll look very neat and just finish the whole thing off. And it will provide a lovely little bench to sit on. It had taken the three of us the best part of a day, but with some basic inexpensive raw materials and a lot of elbow grease, we had given my raised vegetable beds a complete makeover. The following day, the new beds would be ready for planting up, well, almost. These beds have really transformed this area. Although they're rustic, they really smartened the whole space up. Next comes the fun part, the planting up. Before I could kickstart my own organic veg, I wanted to add a woven fence to my raised beds. To make the fence, I began by hammering hazel rods into the soil, which were about 25 millimetres in diameter. It's important the rods are hammered firmly into the ground so they remain rigid. We cut them down so they were 250 millimetres above soil level and ready for weaving. Willow is a fantastic material to use for something like this. It's very good value. It costs about £20 a bundle and you can get all different thicknesses. For this, I've got a maximum size of 10 millimetres at the fat end, so it's nice and easy to use. If it's been cut for some time, then it does dry out and it is much stiffer. So then you need to really soak it in water overnight or for two or three days. And then it's lovely and pliable again. And I've just simply gone in and out, but you can have many different types of weave here. But I've kept it nice and basic, just as we did with the hazel. I made some final adjustments by just snipping off some of the ends to neaten up the fence. Although because of its rustic nature, it doesn't need to look pristine. And finally, they were ready for planting up. I think the simple rustic fence is going to make all the difference in the planting up of these beds. I've got a fantastic selection of herbs here and I'm going to plant them up in big 
bold clumps, partly because I think they look better in distinct drifts, but mainly because I use heaps of herbs in my kitchen. You should always place the plants in their final position before you actually plant them. That way you can make any necessary final adjustments, see the effects, and it saves you a lot of hassle later on. This is rosemary, one of my favourite herbs, but it's different from the rosemary you often see, which has a very vertical upright growth. This one is much more prostrate, that is the branches grow horizontally. So it's an ideal plant for using in the front of a raised bed, it will just drape over the front very nicely. It's got beautiful evergreen foliage, but it also has fantastic blue flowers in spring. There are lots of things you can do with rosemary. You can put sprigs of it in hot boiling water, let it rest a while and then drink that water and it's meant to cure depression. But I think the very best use of rosemary of all is using it with a joint of nice fresh roast lamb. Sage is another fantastic herb. It's almost as useful in the ornamental garden as it is in the herb garden. And the name sage implies wisdom. And if you look in all the old herbals, they said many centuries ago that it did actually help your memory. And now recent research has actually backed that up and they say it is very good for those who need help in that direction. That's certainly me. You often see really old gnarled sage plants and they really don't look attractive. So to prevent that happen, you must remember to cut them hard back every year immediately after flowering and that way you encourage this lovely new growth and you keep it bushy and compact. I love the smell of lavender and I can't wait to see all the bees that these flowers will pull into this area. This is no ordinary lavender, this is lavender dentata, the fringe lavender and that's because it's got nice fringes all the way along its leaves. A lot of people know that lavender makes you feel calm and relaxed, but what I didn't know until recently was that it also, it stimulates your appetite. So not only does it make you happy, but it also can make you fat. Partly one of the most common herbs in the garden, and for very good reasons too. It is so useful, there's just so many dishes that you can add it to. It is a biennial, so you will need to re-sow it every other year. A lot of people have a problem in germinating parsley, and it does take a long time to germinate. It can take up to six weeks. But if you want to speed it up, you just need to sow it in a very shallow drill and then water it in with boiling water. If you don't want to do that, you can just soak the seed overnight beforehand, and that will speed it up no end. I'm really pleased with my new herb beds. But there's one finishing touch I'd like to add because you can't have a great herb garden without good labels. So I got this old slate roofing tile and then with a tile cutter, I cut out this rather smart label. Then using this waterproof chalk marker, you mark on the name. So they're cheap, they're dead easy to make and I think they're just the icing on the cake. As you've just seen, we put these raised beds in over 20 years ago. We've done a bit of repair in the intervening period, woven a few more hazels in. But basically, I've now taken the decision to remove this and replace it with a lovely stone retaining wall. Here you can see I've just dug out or removed the retaining wall on this section. And we're now going to start making up the stone wall. I love stone walling. Everywhere in this area, which is basically the very northern end of the Cotswolds, the houses are made of stone, the roofs are made of stone tiles, and the walls are made of stone. And I think it looks beautiful. Um, so what I did is I actually found some stone walling knocking around. Part of it was left over from building the kitchen, which Dave made. Um, and then I found these amazing stone copings on eBay for 150 quid and I snapped them up. And so Dave actually made the wall. He's a really good stonemason. He's a bricklayer as well as the gardener. And he's done a random rubble stone walling built to courses. So you see he's made it nicely into different courses, all slightly different sizes. And he's used a lime mortar and he's recessed it well back. Um, and he's kept the joints quite thin um, so they don't look too bulgy. So I, um, to me, that is just a lovely stone wall. And this wall 
looks, I think, as good, if not better, than the woven wool that we had before. But obviously the advantage is that this will last for hundreds of years, whereas the woven wool just did me about 20 with a few repairs.